we would have been enriched and blessed. So just leave right now. And I'm already crying. Because God is good. God is good. This won't do it. I mean, it, the, the, the <laughs> this is a start, but it's, it's not going to do it. I'm going to tell you right now. Thank you, Paula. My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. Father, you are an amazing God who for some reason thinks highly of us. You've created us with this ability to, to sing, and we've done that today, and, and not just sing about anything, but to sing about you. And you've given us this opportunity to to hold in our hands two common elements, bread and and juice. But yet they are profound in what they mean when it comes to your love for us in Jesus. Who are we that you would be mindful of us? But yet you've given us this time. We just want to say thank you. We invite you to meet us in this place. To be reminded of your, your tender love that you have for us. That you're a God who doesn't want to live apart from us, but you're a God who wants to be deeply, intimately connected to us. And that's all because of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. We pray these things in that name. Amen. So uh, we were channel surfing the other night. And in our house, that's a little different because we don't have cable. Not that we're too spiritual to, to not have cable, but we're just too poor to afford cable. And when we go on vacation, the highlight of our vacation is actually to have a hotel room with cable. And we're like... What, what's everyone? What's everyone watching? Right? What's all this stuff? And and honestly, we leave the we leave those vacations going. We don't need cable. There was nothing on. I mean, there's Food Network, which is one of my favorites, uh, and then there's Cartoon Network, which is one of my kids' favorites. And all they do is run SpongeBob 24/7. So, so we're at our house channel surfing uh, a couple weeks ago, and all of a sudden the Gong Show was on. Now I remember the original Gong Show. And I don't know who thought it was a brilliant idea to bring it back, but they brought it back. And, and I'm cracking up, not over the horrible performers, not over the panel of judges, but over the host, Tommy Maitland. And I'm like, Tommy Maitland, like, who is this guy, Tommy Maitland? And I'm like, I've never heard of him. I love British humor and comedy, and don't hold that against me. And uh, I do a little research, and Tommy Maitland is actually not a – real person it's a fictional character do you guys know who tommy maitland is michael myers of austin powers fame you heard it here first they haven't gone public with it but it is michael My i'm going where in the world has michael myers been well he's been incognito as this host of the gong show and i'm thinking to myself Number one, why haven't they revealed this yet? Because the show's been on for a couple months. And uh, I'm like, this is, a, this is a fascinating thing to consider. Here's this very famous person in disguise. Here's this very famous person in hiding. Why have they not blown his cover yet? There's something suspenseful about it, isn't there? But he's not the only character who, who likes to kind of go incognito. There's this musician by the name of Sia. You may not know Sia by her name, but you may know her by 
one of her really lousy songs. She's a great artist, but I'm not, you know, Swing from the Chandeliers. You guys know that song? Yeah, not a good song. She's written other, what is it? It's called Chandeliers. Well, whatever it is. She writes better songs than that. But if you know the character, uh, the musician Sia, she's also one who is known for wearing wigs that cover her face, appearing on music shows with interesting boxes covering your face. She does not like to have her identity revealed. When this week, one of the major headlines on my news feed was, Sia was found unmasked in public. As if, you know, showing your face is a bad thing. It also reminds me of one of my favorite movies from a couple years ago, a movie called, now you're going to write this down because you're going to want to go see it. And you know, your pastor doesn't watch your mainstream films primarily. I love these independent, Frank, who saw the movie Frank? That's what I thought. (laughs) And after I tell you the premise of the movie, you're going to want to go see it. Frank is a lead singer for a band who wears a giant plaster head to, to, to hide his identity. And the whole movie, you never know who Frank is underneath. I won't tell you the ending, but under the, the head is an actor by the name of Michael Fassbender, who is an amazing actor, who's a good-looking guy, and it's, a, it's, an, it's an ironic thing to have him covered the entire movie in this plaster head. But as the movie unveils, it tells you why he's covering his face that some sort of catharsis is happening through his singing and through his participation in this band, and you're just kind of like, take off the mask. Show us who you are, because there's something inside of you that, that needs to be known and connected, and, and the world needs to embrace you as you are and who you are and where you are. And, and I think about all these situations, and I go, we may be here this morning, and as far as I know, no one's wearing any plaster heads here. No one's got any cardboard boxes covering their faces. But in a sense, we are here and we are masked. And we do an amazing job of hiding our true identity from other people. We do an amazing job of, 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 of putting up this facade and, and, and we know each other for, you know, boy, man, my week was fantastic. You should have seen how much I had in sales or... Boy, you should have seen how well my kids did in sports. And, you know, we we put our best foot forward. We show our best selves. But deep down inside, if we're truly honest with each other, there's a lot of wrestling within. And I wonder how many of us have found this to be a community where we can truly show our, our true faces. And I think perhaps the reason we have a hard time showing our true faces is We don't fully understand what it means to be fully known by God. Because He fully knows you. And if He fully knows you and loves you and accepts you, how does that carry over into our relationships with one another? I think it should breed confidence that if He loves me and knows everything about me and could condemn me but doesn't, who who are you? And, and it's risky, I know. It's risky to be vulnerable and transparent with one another. But I'm going to tell you right now that, that the church, the body of Christ, this family, this flock of sheep, whatever you want to call us, is best when we are able to be ourselves, warts and all. I am praying that for this community. God continues to press upon me the importance of being open and forthright with my own life. And let me just tell you, there is no shortage of stories and illustrations of how you can fail and you can falter, and yet there's a God who just continues to faithfully pick you up and set you on the right course. I have a hard time doing that sometimes. But this morning... I want us to be encouraged in in the one truth that I think is going to fuel what I'm talking about, and that is who you are in Christ, how God has loved you and accepted you in Him, 
and now the confidence and the freedom you can walk in knowing what your Savior not only has done for you, but continues to do for you this, to this very day. So turn to 1 John chapter 2. And we're going to look at this topic of forgiveness. And forgiveness from God, if you understand it correctly, equals freedom for our lives. Freedom to walk with Him. Freedom to walk with each other. And perhaps to be the most confident people in the world. Continuing to learn how to, to get, to live in the light. To live lives undisclosed, right? To live lives just out there. And why? Because you've been loved so richly by God. And so there's, there's three topics concerning forgiveness i want to talk about this morning first john in this section starts with functional forgiveness there's a lot of dysfunctional forgiveness out there we're going to talk about functional forgiveness what does everyday forgiveness look like in the lives of those who believe in jesus because forgiveness still plays an active part in those who have accepted and received and believed in the the, the Lordship of Christ, Christ as Savior. So functional forgiveness, but functional forgiveness has to have a foundation. So foundational forgiveness is blank number two. And then we're going to talk about forwarding forgiveness, paying it forward. What does it look like to, to move on? I'm going to tell you 90% of our time will be focused on the first two. The third point will be just a closing challenge and encouragement to you, the church. So we begin, and John says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Now, notice the tenderness that comes right out, right? My little children. Like, here's this guy who is a disciple of Jesus who's probably in his 80s, and he's writing to a church where he is a spiritual father to some, he's a spiritual grandfather to others, and you just hear his voice, perhaps shaky, perhaps quivering, perhaps just re re recalling his life of, of walking with Christ and living for the gospel and suffering for it. And he's just saying to the church, my little children. Like, you've got to love his, his pastoral heart. You've got you to love his tenderness that he wants people to do well. He wants people to live for the glory of God. And, that, and that's one thing I want for you. I don't know if I'm at a place to call you my little children because some of you, I could be your kids, amen? But as your pastor, I, I love you and I, and I want what's best for you. And I think the difficulty in the journey is perhaps the, the battle we all have with this thing, three-letter word, sin. I, he says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And sin is the thing that tri trips us up. Sin is that thing that entangles us. Sin is that thing that really messes up the will of God in our lives. Let me, let me define sin this way. It is really a deliberate refusal to follow God's way, to follow God's will, to obey God's word. Sin is a deliberate refusal to say, I don't want you, I don't care for you, I don't need you. I got this. Now, let me, let me just say something that I think maybe some of us have ne never considered before. And it's not this. We live in a sinful world. Read the news. Watch the news. There's a, there's a lot of sin. And we get, we, the church, believers, Christians, we get uptight when people sin. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't know Jesus, if someone doesn't know Jesus, their nature is to sin. So it shouldn't be a surprise. It's like when you hear a duck quack, you go, oh, I can't believe that's a duck. Well, a duck quacks. That's what it does, right? What we should really be flabbergasted by are believers who sin. We who have been enlightened, we who have had hearts turned from hearts of stone to hearts of flesh, we who have had our, 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 our eyes open to the beauty of Jesus, what's a greater affront to the love of God is not 
sinners who sin who have never accepted Jesus. It's those of us who have believed in Jesus and sin. Are you, are you tracking with me? So John says to the church, don't sin. Now what I don't want you to hear is that when you come to Jesus, you stop sinning. That's not reality, right? But also what I don't want you to hear is when you come to Jesus, we're to treat sin lightly or casually. There are some people who take the grace of God and they abuse it. There are some people who say, well, you know what? I'm going to deliberately do what God doesn't want me to do because I know I'm, he'll, he'll forgive me. Romans 6 says that is not a way to live your life. That is dangerous. And you could be self-deceived yourself in really knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior. So I don't want you to take a, well, it doesn't matter. I'll just live life however I want. No, we want to take sin seriously. We want to take, more importantly, the walk of holiness seriously. But what we have to realize and accept, even as believers in Christ, we are still going to sin we are not sinless, but God does want us to sin less. So the growth we experience in Christ is not overnight. It's not like I have a come to Jesus moment, all of a sudden the next day and for the rest of my life I'm perfect. My struggle is still with present sin that God is working to eventually eradicate out of my life. We will never be free from sin this side of eternity, but one day when we meet God face to face, you will be free of it altogether. So the preparation for eternity is God getting rid of the sin, even though we will never be rid of it entirely. We will progressively grow in holiness and righteousness, and we will find that the struggle perhaps grows less severe, but the struggle will be ever-present. Does that make sense? And so I want you to understand that we are going to sin, not that we're looking to do it, not that we think we're beyond it, but when we do, here's John's situation, is when you do, there is something you can do about it, which is the good news because sin really acts as a barrier in our fellowship and relationship with God. What do we do with sin when it happens in our lives as believers? Well, this is where the functional forgiveness comes out. What does he say? He says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Circle the word advocate in your Bibles. This is a wonderful word. Five times it's used in the New Testament. Four times it's used referring to the Holy Spirit. John 14, John 16. But only one time is it in reference to Jesus. And this is why this is significant. It's because Jesus says, I'm going to leave this place, but I'm going to send to you another helper. That other helper is the Holy Spirit. Which means that Holy Spirit is the second helper, which means who's the first helper? Jesus. And what you need to know about Jesus being your advocate is he's the number one helper in your life, according to John. So when you sin and you get into that place where you know you should not be, God says there is an avenue you can take to be once again reconnected to God and deal with the sin. And what's the answer? Jesus, who is our helper? Now, there's, there's, a, there's a deeper meaning to this word that I want you to, to consider. And really, Jesus, according to John in this word, is our defense attorney. Write this down. Now, some of you just mentioning that, you're, you're starting to salivate because you're, you're one of those people who love like courtroom dramas. Right? I mean, I grew up, I'm part of the generation of the O.J. Simpson deal. Right? Like every eye was glued, not just to the white Bronco traveling the, the, the highways of Southern California, 
but the ongoing trial of O.J. Simpson. And, and we have, as a culture haven't shaken this yet. There's been movies made. There's been TV shows made. And then the press conference a couple weeks, I'm like, who's wasting their breath over this? Right? But yet we're fascinated. Right? People read how many John Grisham novels need to be written. When is the cable station, right? We've got Hallmark Channel. We've got Food Channel. When is there going to be like courtroom channel? Like just nonstop. We love courtroom proceeding, don't we? We love to have the, 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 the judge. We like to have the prosecutor. We like to have the defending attorney. And then we, have to have, we like to have the defendant. We like to know the story. Like what's going on here? I just saw a commercial for the Menendez Brothers show. I'm mean, like, Really? Do we need to go there again? Is it, are we that bored as a, as a culture and a people? But if you think about it, there's four people in every courtroom situation. There's the judge. There's the prosecutor. There's the defense attorney. And then there's the, 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 the guilty party. And what John wants us to envision is this setting where we as believers are the ones when we sin in the courtroom. And there's the judge who's played by God, there's the prosecutor that's played by Satan, there's the defense attorney played by Jesus, and then there's us, the guilty party, that are on the stand. Now what Satan does masterfully in the courtroom, the spiritual courtroom, is he is known as the accuser. And all he wants to do is bring shame and bring condemnation and point out all your glaring faults and inconsistencies. And, and Satan is a master at doing this because he even quotes scripture. Remember when Jesus was in the wilderness? And there's Satan like quoting scripture right along Jesus. See, James says the demons believe and shudder. There is a knowledge and there's an understanding that's not necessarily salvific, but Satan is a master of heaping condemnation on God's people and continuing to bring accusation before the throne of God the judge. Here's the good news. You've got the best defense attorney in the universe, Jesus Christ. And what John wants us to envision in our minds is that this guy, Jesus, is going before the judge and pleading our case, not on our merits, but on his merit. Okay, stop right now. Because every time Satan accuses, you have a decision at that moment, being a child of Christ, being adopted into God's family, will you allow Jesus to defend your case or will you defend your case? Because here's how we do it. We excuse away sin, we justify our behavior, and we think we've got a case and we don't. Don't try to out-wile the devil. Don't try to out-argue the accuser. He's been doing this for thousands of years. You as a believer, when you sin, do not look to yourself to self-justify your case. You have one, an advocate, a helper, the defense attorney, uh, attorney to defend you. And if you let him, here's what he says to the father, the judge. I have died for Scott Morgan. I have forgiven Scott of his sins, past, present, future. I have clothed Scott Morgan with my robe of righteousness. And whatever the accuser is trying to bring him down for, I, Jesus, have paid the price for his sin. And Jesus always lives to make that intercession for you before God. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. He always lives to make intercession for you in like situation. This this ought to be good news to us, right? Like we have not just one helper, but two helpers, right? We have a helper in our hearts called the Holy Spirit. 
This is your first blank. And we have the helper in heaven who's Jesus the righteous one. See, you have more help than you ever knew was available to you. And when God is your helper, you have no want. When God is your helper, you have no lack. When God is your helper, you have everything you need. Christians, believers, rise up and stand confident in the salvation that is yours through Jesus Christ. Amen? So we have this helper that exists in our hearts called the Holy Spirit who is able to connect our hearts to heaven because of Jesus, who translates those prayers we can't even utter to Jesus. And, and we have this helper who is able to challenge us and convict us and bring things to the surface that we wouldn't see outside of his help. This is according to Romans chapter 8. But we have a helper in heaven. So not only do we have a helper here on earth, we have a helper in heaven who day and night pleads our case before the Father. And because his defense of us is based upon his merits his merits are perfect his merits are righteous his merits are spotless and sinless and perfect you have nothing to worry about because it is him pleading for you you guys this brings me confidence because how quick am i to try to defend myself how quick am i to say oh that's not really what it is you know, me taking a little bit of money from here. You know, you sleeping with someone, not your, your spouse. You know, you not walking in character and integrity. You driving beyond the speed limit or listening to Metallica, whatever it may be. <laughs> Who were just in town. I wish I kind of went, but I didn't. So, oh well. Still working through that. But we have this tendency to not allow God to bring up the crap that he needs to bring up. Why? Because we don't think it's important. And he said, it is. Let it rise, let it come to the service, and let Jesus deal with it. Because he is going to defend your case before the Father. You guys, this is too good. See, on the cross, when Jesus cried out, it is finished. I wish there was a part that said, but he's not finished with us yet. It is finished accomplishing salvation for those he would choose but it is not finished of him being an ever-present advocate for us it is finished and he is still finishing it and i praise god for such a wonderful high priest i'm thankful for such a wonderful advocate i am thankful for such an understanding helper because he can understand and he understands perfectly and because of his death, he represents us better than we could represent ourselves. So when sin happens, we're praying it doesn't. But when it happens, what's our course? We go to Jesus. You know what I'm guilty of. You know what I'm really being, I'm ashamed of right now. You know what I'm condemning myself over. You know the ungrace I'm heaping into my life, but I'm coming to you, Jesus. Because you not only promised to die for me on the cross and save me, but you are promising right now in this moment where I am broken because of the sin that I've committed against a righteous, holy, perfect God who says, I love you as my son, I love you as my daughter, but I've done something. I've rebelled against his will. I've not accepted his word and Jesus, I'm coming to you and I'm saying, I'm sorry. Plead my case before the Father. And Jesus goes and does exactly that. And like the woman caught in the act of adultery, he says to us, go and sin no more. That's good news. And if he's making intercession for us night and day, and he never gives up, that's even wonderful news, too. It's not like, oh, close, I'll be back at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Sin creeps up on us at all times of day, all days during the week. It does not rest, it does not sleep. But he lives ever to make intercession for us. Do not ever think you will exhaust the patience or kindness of love of your God. He's always there for us. Amen? Like the guy that got, just got busted in Britain for throwing too many bottles with messages into the water looking for that special woman that he could spend the rest of his life with. 
He's done this repeatedly. Thousands of bottles. Finally, Britain said, listen, we're going to fine you if you do this anymore. We understand your desire for connection and love. But listen, all these bottles are coming up and littering the beaches. <laughs> Is that good news? Right? God's not like that. He's not saying, hey, 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 too many. You've come in my courtroom too many times. Functional forgiveness daily. Your Savior, your Lord Jesus is your advocate, your defense attorney, continually going before the Father for you. Now we move from the courtroom to the temple where we need to talk about foundational forgiveness because how is this even possible? We can't forget about the basis of Him interceding for us without understanding first the cross. Because there's no intercession without a cross. There's no high priest representing us without a cross. So we come to foundational forgiveness. We've already sung about this. We've already shared communion. And Ryan did a fantastic job of leading us in understanding why we do what we do and remembering the, the death of Jesus. Well, John says in verse 2, And he himself is the propitiation. Circle that word because... Most of us here have no clue what this is. This even in English, what does that word even mean? Some translations have atoning sacrifice, but propitiation is the word I want us to to linger on and understand. Because I will tell you, if you don't understand propitiation, you don't understand the cross. This word is that important. Propitiation literally means satisfies. Circle the word propitiation in your margin, write satisfies. And I'm still talking to a pen and paper generation where I know most of you are on your electronic devices right now. So with your finger, write a digital arrow, write the word satisfies. Because... If there's no satisfaction in what happened upon the cross, then there's no salvation for those who would believe. What do I mean by satisfaction? Well, let's talk about four words that are important. In your blanks, the cross and God's holiness. The cross and God's justice. The cross and God's love and the cross and God's wrath. So the four blanks should be holiness, justice, love, and wrath. And I want to unpack these words because the cross is the intersection where all these four things meet. And if you leave any one aspect out, you don't have the cross, you don't have the gospel, you don't have eternal life. Old Testament. Let's talk about Indiana Jones. No, Indiana Jones is not in the Old Testament. But there's this thing called the Ark of the Covenant that is in the Old Testament. And I would say, side note, Raiders of the Lost Ark, one of the greatest action movies ever made. Even with Nazis and their melting faces, which my kids love that part. So, hasn't given them nightmares yet, but the Nazis and melting faces, right? So, when's the next time you're going to hear that in a sermon or a message, huh? So here's the Ark of the Covenant, right? We all saw like pictures of the Ark. So here's this golden and laden chest. And inside this chest are the Ten Commandments and the, the Rod of Aaron. And over the chest are these angels, right, guarding the chest. And every so often the priests would go in this special room called the Holy of Holies and take the blood of a spotless lamb and dump it over the Ark of the Covenant because the Ark of the Covenant was symbolic of where God met with His people, the Ark top called the Mercy Seat. Well, Hebrews says there's somebody who becomes the Mercy Seat for us, and that is Jesus. But in the meantime, forward-looking Israel said, we will do what God has commanded us. So this is the place where God meets man, but man, God can't meet man because He's holy and men are sinful. Men and women are sinful. But the blood of a spotless animal poured over the ark, over this mercy seat, will be the place where his 
justice and wrath is satisfied in order to meet humanity. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Back to that sin problem again. Sin hinders us from walking with God. Now, why are these four points important? Number one, God is holy. Sin belittles the holiness of God. God is pure. God is righteous. He can have nothing to do with sin. So there is a barrier. So, Because God is holy and he wants to have relationship with sinful humanity, this is where, number two, his justice comes in. Something must happen where God's justice is vindicated. I wish it was simple as just brushing sin under the rug and forgetting about it. But that wouldn't do anything regarding the character of God who created men and women originally to walk in perfect righteousness. But who botched the deal? We did! And there's nothing we can do to get back into right relationship. All fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 So God has to be a just God and deal with the problem of sin. This is where love comes in. For God so loved the world that he sent his son. So now all of a sudden you have this demonstration of God's love towards humanity. Because why? God's love causes him to love sinners. And because of God's love, he sends his son into the world to die on a cross for his sins? No, for our sins. And I'm going to tell you, I love how John Stott put it. And if you want to read a book that will probably cause your, your brain to bleed, which is not necessarily a bad thing, The Cross of Christ by John Stott, perhaps the greatest book outside the Bible written on the cross. John Stott says this, God does not love us because Christ died for us. Christ died for us because God loved us. If it is God's wrath which needed to be propitiated, it is God's love which did the propitiating. None of us, individually or collectively, could ever pay the price that God's justice demanded. So what does God do? He sends His Son. God comes to our planet flesh and blood, 100% humanity, 100% divinity, never lost his divinity, but added to the humanity onto himself and becomes humanity's perfect substitute. Now, let's just stop and understand, I'm not talking about this, uh, you know, satisfying this angry God, kind of like this, you know, we see the picture of the volcano and these tribes, people all stand on the edges of the volcano with a headless chicken or a basket of fruit going, I hope our God accepts this offering. We don't worship a capricious, whimsical God like that. Here's a God who pays the price himself. Here's a God who says, you can't do it. All of you combined could never do it. All the headless chickens in the world couldn't do it. And he steps in himself. That is love. So upon that cross, Christ hangs. And there's a moment in that crucifixion where everything grew pitch black in the middle of the afternoon, grows pitch black, and you hear Christ cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is the fourth point, the cross and God's wrath. There's a moment in the crucifixion of Jesus where God pours out His wrath that we justly deserve but do not receive because He heaps it upon Jesus for us. And what a dark, 
and terrible and horrific time that must have been for him who knew no sin to become sin for us. In his humanity, he fu- fully bore the full weight of sin that should condemn us to hell, but now gives us eternal life. The, cr- the cry for Jesus was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The cry of sinful humanity that understands the sacrifice should be, my God, my God, why have you even accepted me? The fact that Jesus would endure something he didn't need to or have to, but he willingly did it, ought to stagger us. The wrath that should have been poured out on sinners was poured out on Christ. The judgment that should have been poured out on sinners was experienced by Jesus. The hell that was experienced by Jesus should have been poured out on us sinners. And all of a sudden... Because of Jesus bearing the full weight of the wrath poured out against sin for those who would believe satisfaction has taken place. God is no longer angry with you who believe. You don't have to wake up in the morning and go, Does God like me today? Should I step foot out of my house? Should I even bother taking a shower? Does does he like me today? Let me tell you right now, God doesn't like you. He loves you. Cross equals love. Cross equals acceptance. Cross equals God says, yes, you are mine. And there's no longer a wall of hostility between you and the Father. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, you are now accepted. My God, my God, why have you accepted me? When we hold those communion elements in our hands, maybe we should tremble more. Maybe we should weep more. When we consider the staggering price paid for us to be saved, to have freedom, it ought to just move us deeply. Why would we choose sin when there's been satisfaction? Why do we would choose a course of of knowingly rebelling against God who says, I love you. What child that has only received good from his parent or her parent says, screw you, I'm going to live life the way I want. Who? But we ought to be humbled to the place where we say, my life is yours. My heart is yours. My ears are yours. My eyes are yours. Everything I have is yours because you didn't spare anything to have relationship with me. And so now I want to return to you and say, I am grateful, I am thankful, and I'm going to live my life for your glory and nothing else. That is awesome love. John 3, 36. He who believes the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God rests on him. I wonder how those who don't believe manage. If they were given spiritual eyes to see the wrath being built up against them, that they'll never survive against this holy, just God, they will never survive. But praise God, I pray he gives us spiritual eyes to understand that there is no longer condemnation for those who believe in Christ Jesus, only eternal life. Amen? And so, in closing, John says, functional, daily, advocate, pleading your case, live in it, enjoy it. The foundation for this is the cross and what Jesus did upon that cross. And for those who would believe, 
That is foundational. You're set up to walk in such an amazing relationship with God. Now, here's the question. Why would you want to keep that just for yourselves? So John says, you have this advocate. You've got Jesus' propitiation. And not for your sins only, but also for those of the whole world. John says, God is still saving people today. And if we're alive tomorrow, God will still save people tomorrow. What John's not saying is the whole world's going to be saved. The whole world is not going to be saved. We don't preach a universalism here. But what he's saying is the cross is so magnificent that it will cover everyone's sins who comes to him and believes. And if there's the whole world, so be it. But we know people die without Christ. But for those who are still alive, know that the cross of Christ is more than sufficient. It is perfectly satisfying for the Father. Which means no one is beyond the reach of God's love. Amen? No one is beyond the reach of God's grace. Amen? That there are people who still have an opportunity to come out under that that wrath that's being built up and experience life and freedom and joy and salvation in Christ. Don't be hogs. Don't hoard it. Go share it. If he's put a new song in your hearts, go sing it. If he's changed you, share it with others because your life, your story is powerful enough to connect with some other person who thinks that they are beyond the reach of God's love. Jesus' cross covers all who will believe, no matter where they've been, what the, what's happened to them, what they've done. God's grace is more than sufficient. Amen? Good stuff. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, I uh, am so grateful for a church, a community, a family where we could sit around the truths of of the gospel, the the truths of Jesus and and your love that's poured out to the world through him. And and we can celebrate and we can cry and we can rejoice and we can just be moved, Lord. Lord, Thank you for this time. It's it's all about you. Thank you for Christ, our, our Lord, our Savior, who makes it all possible. Lord, let us live in the truths that we've uncovered today. Thank you for loving us so perfectly, so unconditionally, so faithfully. It is truly such a wonderful gift you've given us in Christ. And Lord, may we realize that while the gospel is a wonderful treasure, it is also our sacred trust. And you've called us to be faithful to share that with others. I pray we have opportunities to share about the hope and the joy and the life we have. That's not of our own, but it's entirely from you, through Jesus. So, Father, be glorified in our lives. Thank you for loving us in Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and his peace forever and ever. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week, all right? See you soon, all right?